Well, there's not much to the story. Jesus says we're going to Jerusalem. Friends say, don't. Jesus says, gotta. Friends say, whatever. <laughs> and there they go together down the hill and over the river and through the gate and into the city. Friends walking, Jesus riding, children singing, pilgrims cheering, authorities fretting. This is not new stuff here, but it is good stuff. Captivating stuff, energizing and engaging stuff. It is the story of Jesus, the country boy, riding into the big city as if to say, here I am. Make of me what you will. Do with me what you will. There is no longer any point of keeping my ministry tucked away in the Galilee. Well, it looked so promising. Right man, right message, right place, right time. Things could have taken off from there, except they didn't, given that by Friday he was dead. We're talking five days. I mean, it wasn't even time enough to make the cover of Newsweek. Everything was packaged with so much promise, but it failed to deliver, or so it seemed. Drop back with me for just a moment to the preceding days when Jesus is in Jericho. Now, the last time that I was sick enough to require an antibiotic, I remember the doctor's warning. Take the whole bottle, take every last capsule, even if you feel better halfway through, which you probably will. It's the only way to prevent a relapse. Well, I obeyed, but I found myself offended. Relapse. The very word is offended. I'm offended. But I, of all people, should know better because relapse is the stock and trade of my work. I mean, people relapse all the time. They relapse into doubt, into poor choices, into depression, into dysfunctional ways of doing and thinking as they play out those scripts that have been written for them two and three generations ago. Which brings me back to temptation, for temptation is one of the things into which people relapse. Last week we spoke about Jesus' time in the Judean desert near Jericho. Jesus, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Still wet from his baptism, he has to make choices. Turn bread into stone, feeding yourself and anyone else who is hungry. Defy gravity and throw yourself down from the pinnacle of this building, proving that God will not let you be broken. Swear your allegiance to me and by so doing, control the destiny of the nations. Now who makes these offers? The adversary makes these offers. The adversary without? Or an adversary within? That's it. You've got it. At any rate, after 40 days, Jesus left the wilderness, and the tempter left Jesus. But did the tempter leave Jesus for good? Personally, I think not. In the letter to the Hebrews, the writer says that Jesus is elevated as our great high priest. But in the next breath, the writer challenges those who claim that Jesus is not like ordinary people. No, in all ways he was tempted just as we are tempted, which means always. Jesus was faced with the same temptation on as many fronts as we face it. With that in mind, let me suggest that Palm Sunday follows what I call the fourth great temptation of Jesus. In the company of his disciples, his band of misfits, Jesus has just spent several days in Jericho. Delightful place, Jericho, one of the oldest cities in the world, whose history goes back 11,000 years. It is a spring-fed oasis located on the west bank of the Jordan River, just before the spot where the river empties into the Dead Sea. The climate is warm and dry, supporting the growing of citrus fruit, including some of the largest oranges I have ever seen. 
Today it is a lovely town where mostly Arabs dwell. But Jericho is also the scene of a dark wood moment, a dark wood choice, a divided path. As Jesus and his disciples are walking the road that leads out of Jericho, they approach a decision. One road goes north to the Galilee, and the other road goes south and west to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know how you identify temptation, but I know that a divided path is as good a place as any to find one. Consider Jesus' alternatives. Shall I go north to the Galilee? There are good reasons to go. I love it there, and they love me there. My disciples would prefer that I return. They've told me so. My mother, who thinks I'm mad, wants me to come home. She's told me so. My father is dead. The family business may be suffering. There are people who depend on me in the Galilee. You know, if I go north, I am pretty much assured that I will lead a full life and die in my bed. And I can use the additional time. I mean, there is this strange power that seems to emanate from me, the potential of which I am just now coming to understand. And whatever that power may be, there are people who seem to want it. So isn't that reason enough to go on to the Galilee? What could be wrong with that? Or I could go south and west to Jerusalem. An almost certain glory. <gasps> oh, my people need a leader. They cry out. Some of them just cry. Perhaps this thing is bigger than me. Perhaps this is the voice of history drafting me. If drafted, shall I run? If elected, shall I serve? Vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people, the voice of God. How do I tell them apart? Could they be one? They have been before. Besides, who will step forward if not me? My nation does not lack for people who are primed to draw the sword against Rome. I understand what they feel because that same hot blood of nationalism flows through my veins. But others possess less patience and less discernment than myself. I should know. Don't I have among my closest twelve two who are known as the sons of thunder? And one, Judas, who is connected to that group of insurrectionists sometimes called the Dagger Society? And if in the process a little glory should come my way, is that always bad? What could be wrong with glory if it comes by accident, not by quest? To which the adversary said, Right on. Oh, don't worry about it. Give them what they want. Be the Messiah they want. Feed them, dazzle them, lead them. Oh, things could get a little bloody at first, but you'll be able to work things around to your way of thinking once the victory is won. Whereupon Jesus may well have said, you know, that makes sense. I could get into that. And a part of me would like to. But something about it just doesn't fit right. To which the adversary might have said, Ah, that's too bad. I could have made you a star. I could have made you great. They would have loved you in Jerusalem. But now all bets are off. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if they turned on you. And that conversation, whether it occurred or not, contains hints of this third alternative. You know, I could go south to Jerusalem and west, all the while being who I am, or more importantly, refusing to be who I am not. I can go to Jerusalem letting the chips fall where they may, even though at the end of the day, I may find myself numbered among the chips. And those are the choices. I can go to the Galilee and die in my bed. I can go to Jerusalem and die in a palace. 
I can go to Jerusalem and die on a hill. You know, it's so simple to see things in a rearview mirror and so difficult to see them when they're right in front of you. It's hard to see them when you're standing at an intersection in the dark wood because a divided path is always where decisions are most agonizing. A divided path is where you're forced to do the proing and the conning on the, on the one handing and on the other handing, which is always the stuff of life. And the divided path is always where the tempter is because we are always at a point where we are forced to separate the bad from the good or the good from the better or the better from the best. And there are people who will always help you rationalize any choice that you make. Last summer, it was late in the afternoon at the Arrowhead Golf Clubhouse. The sun was slanting and the chairs were filling. The music was playing. A soprano was singing. The camera was waiting. A couple hundred hearts were beating. One young man's blood pressure was rising. Two mothers were twisting their hankies. And then suddenly the song ended. The soprano sat. The music swelled. The adrenaline surged. The bridesmaids walked. The people rose. And for one last time, the father said to his daughter, I just want you to know that you do not have to go through with this. <laughs> you don't have to go through with this. I wish Jesus... Someone had said that to Jesus at the Jericho Junction. But people did say that to Jesus at the Jericho Junction. Don't go, they said. Veer north, they said. Boy, you wouldn't have to ask me twice. You wouldn't have to ask me twice. At least with the part of me that buys into what I call the myth of the Colorado high country. Oh, the way we talk about it gives it away. You know, by the time I get to Evergreen, or by the time I get to Georgetown, or by the time I get to the Eisenhower Tunnel, all the stress has just poured out of me and my body, and it just, life oozes back in, one pour after grateful pour after another. Anne and I were sitting on the deck of her cabin, overlooking the Twin Lakes and Mount Elbert. And I heard myself saying to her, there's just one thing I do not understand. How can you ever leave this place? And in a night of fitful sleep, I answered that question. I would have to leave it. Dang. I would have to leave that place even in this sweet transition into retirement. It is too early in my life to withdraw from so much of my life. I would have to leave because there are needs in me that cannot be met there, drives in me that cannot be fulfilled there, truths in me that cannot be expressed there, and callings in me that cannot be answered there. I would have to leave because there is more to the world than beauty and more to my soul than tranquility. I would have to leave because there is a restlessness that ferments in me and I have seen it in you. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I call that restlessness God. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, I call that restlessness nervous energy. <laughs> but on most days, including Sundays, I call that restlessness passion. I would have to leave because I cannot, in a place of withdrawal, fulfill my passion. I would have to believe as you would because the idea of never leaving sounds like a denial of everything that I am about. So I suppose that whatever else Palm Sunday is, it is about Jesus being the best possible Jesus that he can be. Jesus fulfilling his passion, which meant for him going southbound on Highway 90 down the ramp, which leads to Jerusalem. You don't have to understand it, but you do have to admire it. And were you to tag along, it would be nice for his sake and for yours as well. This is the gift of companioning, the gift of 
misfits. As we enter the dark wood alone and stay there alone, the odds are stacked against us that we will be back at the adversary's table, drinking and worshiping at the altar of the mediocre, of the status quo, of the safe, of the predictable. And the Spirit knows this. That's why the Spirit gives us the dark wood gift, maybe the most important of all, a community of fellow misfits. <laughs> now you may react to that word, misfit. However, misfits, or outliers, as I like to call you, are those who are being as intentional as you are about embracing the gifts of the dark wood and finding their true place in this world. Those who swim against the current, you might call them mentors or spiritual friends or a community of faith. Which is why at every divided path in the wood, I keep falling into step with Jesus. Still not certain of my motives, still not certain of my destination, but I find that I have come to trust his leading. And I find that the one thing that I can't be without is the pleasure of his company as we walk the dark wood. Amen. <laughs>